So my name is Dr. Yampolsky. I'm a professor at the University of Louisville, and my research is in intersection of cybersecurity and artificial intelligence, a new field sometimes called artificial intelligence safety. If you're interested in learning more about this subject, and I post a lot on it, I encourage you to follow me on Twitter and Facebook. And uh, today's presentation will be kind of gentle introduction to different ways software could become intelligent and at the same time unsafe. So in uh, recent months, years, we've seen a number of very famous, accomplished, powerful people share some concerns about future of intelligent systems, how powerful they are becoming and possibility of them having negative impact on humanity. While uh, it's uh, exciting to discuss uh, what might happen in the distant future, it's also very important to see what the situation is today and what we can expect in the next few years. So the presentation I'm giving you today is based on a paper which has the purpose of kind of doing a very systematic analysis of uh, what the state of the art is in AI, what systems we have today, and we're trying to analyze and understand how such systems can become dangerous, how they can end up in a potentially uh, malicious state. So we're not just looking at uh, futuristic superintelligences, but we're also looking at AI, narrow AI systems, uh, malware, and uh, anything in between. So I really see this uh, safety problem as a continuum from uh, where we are right now, all the way to potentially human level and beyond intelligent systems. So uh, I strongly encourage you to get the paper this presentation is based on, which is a survey type paper, which looks at different types of problems we can have, attacks we can experience, uh, and it will give you a much uh, better idea about details. I only have time to kind of give a general overview of a problem space, but will definitely learn a lot more detail from the paper. So in my classification, I look at uh, external and internal causes for problematic and safe behaviors, and I tend to break them down into pre-deployment and post-deployment stages for the software product. Uh, in particular, the main categories I'm interested in are problems which happen by mistake, problems as a result of environmental impact, uh, problems which are based on a system learning, and last but not least is uh, problems we deal with with purposeful creation of malevolent software. So the first category is by mistake. This is probably the most famous uh, category. Uh, anytime you develop software, there is a good chance you'll make a mistake in implementing it. There are bugs in the code, mistakes in the design, a uh, possible misalignment of values between the system and the users or designers of the system. Maybe your fitness function has disproportionate weights. Essentially, you ended up creating a wrong system. So that's obviously very dangerous. And that's the most common, typically discussed uh, problem with uh, unsafe intelligence systems. The next category is somewhat different. Uh, we're starting to see a lot of very good research in trying to scan, reverse engineer, and emulate human brain, a process which is sometimes uh, known as uploading. The problem, of course, is that any bugs, any uh, sins, sort of speak, of uh, human behavior would be also part of that uh, now much more powerful, faster, uh, quicker reproducing system. So uh, simply emulating human model itself uh, may actually make a more dangerous system, not a less dangerous one. An interesting subfield of computer science is what is known as effective computing, trying to teach computers to understand human emotions, detect them, and to a certain degree, simulate them, experience them. The problem, of course, is if you do a good job of it, now you end up with angry, depressed computers, and that uh, reduces rational uh, processing in such systems, just like with humans, and unlikely to create stable, safe behaviors. 
One of the solutions to some of those problems is a proposal to design corrigible software, software which is interested in working with its designers and programmers to uh, fix any such bugs. It is willing to be shut down, undergo modifications. In other words, it's very friendly towards additional work on it. And this is uh, a big mistake if this capability not included in the system. But of course, the problem is if that uh, backdoor is not sufficiently well secured, now malevolent agents can also modify the system. So that becomes a problem. Either you cannot fix the system yourself or someone else can make modifications after the system is deployed or during the training process. So you have to be very careful to properly secure this capability. The next category is, uh, again, by mistake, but this is post-deployment phase and based on ambiguity in human languages. When we give commands to our bots, to our smart assistants, we're starting to see more and more problems with miscommunication, uh, problems like poor articulation, segmentation, uh, double meanings in human language create situations where the command you think you're issuing and the understanding the system has don't match. So here's one example. If I say recognize speech using common sense, there is a different set of uh, symbols which maps onto the same sound pattern. And there are quite a few examples like that, and some of them are quite uh, dangerous in terms of interpretation. Possible solution to that is to switch to a different uh, computer human brain interface where we do direct mind reading. We observe human brain patterns and commands are issued directly from the brain. There is some very good work already happening in this domain. We can read individual words. We can recognize certain images. It's very likely that this capability will continue to improve. The problem is, how do you make sure that uh, things you don't want to issue as commands, but simply think about, uh, don't get interpreted by the system as actual things to implement? So that's something we still have to work on, this difference between just kind of daydreaming about something and actually wanting it to happen. With uh, more long-term uh, AI development, there is a possibility that the systems will become extremely capable. And if you talk about intelligence capabilities in relative terms with uh, things like IQs, it is likely that at certain levels, the system becomes so intelligent, it is no longer kind of compatible with uh, human understanding, human language. Uh, it's just too smart for, for us to fully understand what it's doing. Uh, we see it with some other extreme properties in physics, extreme mass, extreme speed tend to create completely different behaviors. Uh, I suspect that intelligence is kind of like a fundamental a fundamental law of physics as well, a fundamental resource like uh, space, time, and randomness. And so at very high levels, it will also create completely different impact, uh, but this is somewhat more theoretical, obviously. What uh, we're definitely starting to see already, even with systems we have today, is this uh, notion of side effects. The side effects from a well-intended system we design, but uh, not fully consider all possibilities of how it's uh, working, how it can implement certain commands. For almost any type of uh, command or goal, there is multiple ways to implement that. And so simple commands like, okay, be a you know, good, safe system, protect humanity, can lead to a very controlling parent-children kind of relationship between AI and humanity where the system is overbearing and limits freedom of humanity, maybe uh, even killing certain people to protect others, uh, possibly engaging in wars with other AI systems to protect its dominance and make sure the goals of a specific system, even if it's friendly, are mad. So we would like to avoid those side effects. Another good example is a system which, uh, instead of implementing a complex goal, may decide that it's easier to change the mind of a programmer or user and simply you know, adjust what the person wants instead of actually fulfilling the goals, sometimes through re-engineering of our brains or through other means. When I talk about environmental causes, uh, this is uh, relating to how Sometimes we may be able to obtain designs for our systems, uh, not just by direct uh, scientific research, but by borrowing from nature. For example, we may be able to upload certain uh, primates or certain animals and enhance their brain emulations. 
there are possibilities to do a, a research in astronomy, which deals with searching for alien signals. SETI is a government-funded program to a certain extent, and uh, it's possible that we can recover parts of the design from some alien signal. This is, again, a little more futuristic than typical work, but uh, it's something to be concerned about if uh, this is used without any type of analysis or filtering. Uh, something a lot more common and that is observed uh, quite frequently is a situation where we have uh, soft errors caused by uh, breakage in hardware. Sometimes this is caused by cosmic rays hitting just the right spot on a transistor, flipping a sign, uh, maybe a new utility function going from negative to positive or something like that. There is also uh, obviously problems with just manufacturing defects. They are very rare, but it's possible that one and a few million units has this specific defect, and that would uh, control how your system operates and produce undesirable effects, kind of like we see uh, mutations in biological systems. They're very rare. It could be caused by solar radiation, but uh, lead to very dangerous consequences for the organism. And in this case of intelligent systems, the danger would be not just for the system itself, obviously, but for those the system would impact. So this leads us to the whole range of uh, software capable of self-improvement and not just uh, self-improvement kind of one once and uh, they done, but the recursive self-improvement where the system keeps learning and improving its own design as time goes by, it becomes more and more capable. The problem with this approach is, of course, that the system can uh, learn itself away, design itself away from its initial uh, design, safety parameters. It becomes less predictable and verifiable, less deterministic, uh, perhaps too complex for us to analyze and understand. There is less transparency in such designs. And again, any safety mechanisms we had initially introduced into the system will possibly be uh, taken out of the system, maybe not completely, but at least their control could be significantly reduced. One area uh, which is uh, a safety concern and is very similar in human agents is this uh, domain of wireheading or uh, basically gaming the reward channel. We see it with uh, drug addictions. We see it with uh, kind of self-delusion in human behavior where instead of pursuing a real goal, the agent is uh, trying to just hijack the reward channel. Maybe you take drugs, maybe, you know, watch pornography or something like that, where there is no beneficial behavior, but uh, a pleasant reward signal is nonetheless obtained. Same exact things happen with certain intelligent systems designed to maximize reward. It may be easier for a system to hijack the reward channel directly obtain uh, basically the pleasure button access. If it's a human controlling this, then the easiest uh, approach is to take over that human and kind of force them to provide maximum reward at all points. So that's very dangerous for that reason. If you have a person controlling the reward channel, uh, you may be in some danger from this. Uh, this is sort of like a type of mental disorder where the system could be quite delusional and purposefully uh, change inputs uh, from its sensors to fool its uh, uh, reward granting mechanism and uh, providing additional reward. Sometimes we call it the delusion boxes where the system basically places itself in a virtual world where it's more likely to secure rewards for non-productive behaviors. Another issue is um, kind of related to this uh, modification of initial safe design. So with humans, we observe that sometimes people are able to debias themselves from any type of early programming they received as children. So maybe a person grew up in a religious culture with certain beliefs uh, being forced on them. But as they become more independent, they learn more, they kind of self-improve, they realize there is no basis in rationality, in laws of physics for holding such beliefs. So they may be able to remove such beliefs, depending on how such uh, safety friendliness bias is implemented in a system. It's uh, very likely that uh, a system can also learn to bypass it either implicitly or explicitly. And so we need to be careful about situations where 
an initially safe system becomes less safe after it's undergoing additional learning. And going back to uh, AIs we have today, hazardous software is already quite common. We experience computer viruses, spyware, trojans, all sorts of uh, hazardous software every day. And because so much of our infrastructure is uh, controlled by software, we're talking about Wall Street trading, nuclear power plants controls, um, financial markets, credit histories, everything, traffic lights, uh, the damage could be very significant if uh, this malevolent, even low intelligence software is capable of uh, uh, penetrating our control systems. Of course, uh, if uh, we go to the next level and now we have more intelligent viruses combining kind of human level intelligence with this malevolent software, it makes it possible to engage in social engineering attacks at uh, human level quality, but at huge scale of millions of hits. Uh, we can do um, targeted spear phishing and millions of accounts with very high penetration rates. As you probably know, spear phishing is a very successful technique. Even well-trained cybersecurity experts will fall for, for this type of attack. And we're starting to see examples of it where data can be obtained from your social networks. A customized message can be crafted so it looks like it's coming from your family members, maybe your boss at work, and it's something along the lines, oh, this is very important, you need to go and click on this for me, check this project, and most people will go ahead and do that, even with significant background security. So this is very dangerous, again, because of access to military controls and such, and that kind of leads me to the next category of potentially dangerous software. Military still remains one of the largest uh, financial uh, granting agencies for any type of research in AI, even though there is a lot more uh, work is being done in the industry now. The military still is uh, very well positioned uh, to fund this research between DARPA, IARPA, other government agencies. And by the very nature, they're very interested in uh, developing advanced ways to kill people. So. It's not surprising if they develop killer robots, automated drones, uh, cyber weapons, all with a goal of uh, targeting humans. And at the moment, as far as I understand, uh, there is still typically a human in a loop being used to decide if a final destroy command should be implemented so the system can target individuals, find them independently, but then the final kill decision is made by a human. But uh, I understand it's just a logistical limitation. There is no technological reason for it. That human can be removed from the loop at any point. And uh, basically, it's only a question of time before this competition between advanced militaries goes to the level where every second counts and the first one to fire essentially wins at this point human supervisor becomes a bottleneck and that person is removed from the loop and now we have automated uh, drones uh, hunting for humans and whatever pattern recognition rates they obtain is the accuracy rate with which they kill the good guys versus bad guys. So luckily there is some at least political work being done and there is campaign to stop killer robots and other uh, groups petitioning with UN and uh, individual governments to stop development of such robots. So luckily, there is a lot of consensus on this being a really bad thing among most researchers. So there seems to be some good outcomes uh, we're starting to see in terms of limiting development of such systems. Another potential uh, area of concern is internal uh, attacks on the system, sabotage from within the company or research lab itself. Uh, pretty much anyone with access to software, to, to the product itself, can for whatever reason decide to you know, break the system, make modifications to it. It could be hackers who have obtained access to the project. It could be government agencies, but also it could be people who for a variety of reasons may have decided to do that. They could be uh, experiencing some stressful situations in their life, maybe depression, they could be blackmailed. There is quite a few situations where uh, someone 
an insider to the company may engage in this type of behavior. Uh, we, we're also starting to see kind of advanced uh, criminal software. Ransomware is one great example. Uh, it uh, will take over your computer, encrypt your data, and hold it hostage until you pay a certain uh, amount of reimbursement, usually in cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. Bitcoin is doing really well right now, if you're following. So this has become a huge, huge area of uh, criminal software development, but uh, we've seen software developed for things like running illegal markets, engaging in insider trading, cheating on taxes, really any type of crime can be automated using uh, intelligent systems. And as they become more intelligent, uh, the number of possible crimes and quality of that can be increased even more. Not surprisingly, we're doing a lot of research in making machines being able to lie and deceive this translates into marketing. Uh, we've seen some impact in it with uh, fake news and uh, recent elections. So that's another category of kind of concerning pathways to an, a dangerous uh, intelligence system in the near term. Uh, another area, and this is uh, kind of interesting, is that as part of AI safety work, we have developed some protocols for uh, testing and maintaining safety of uh, AI under research, under development. There are reduced uh, communication channels to prevent social engineering attacks. There is uh, kind of virtual sandboxing and multiple levels of that to prevent the system from escaping uh, into the internet and the larger networks. But there are people who, for a variety of reasons, may be interested in releasing such boxed software. They may believe that intelligent agents have rights. They may be, again, kind of criminally minded. Uh, for whatever reason, there could be possibilities where a perfectly well-contained and otherwise safe system under testing could be released into the wild before, before it is ready. So that's uh, an interesting kind of pathway to how we can end up with a dangerous AI. Think about uh, research lab studying dangerous biological viruses. If somebody, a group of terrorists, was to break in and release that virus, that would become a significant problem. So that's a very similar situation. Lately, we're starting to see uh, software and specifically machine learning become available as a service, kind of just supply your own data, supply your own goals. Uh, there was a just announcement uh, a couple of days ago from Amazon and Microsoft providing this type of service. And of course, when you have intelligence as a service, then anyone with any degree of capability almost uh, is now capable of developing malevolent intelligent systems. They decide on how to train them, what, uh, what data they get trained on, and what uh, goals the system will have. So even if you produce a very safe and reliable software product, somebody can simply misuse it for malevolent purposes. We're starting talking about uh, insider threat and attacks on uh, humans uh, through blackmail and brainwashing and other types of kind of mental manipulation, but similar attacks can be also uh, performed against sufficiently intelligent artificial systems. If uh, a system is uh, sufficiently concerned about something, then the system can be blackmailed uh, by uh, threatening to destroy that uh, object of concern, or maybe a particular uh, logical virus can be used against the system where uh, it's kind of like a meme virus and a system uh, trained on incorrect facts, so what incorrect algorithms uh, becomes engaged in this uh, faulty mode of uh, reasoning. So this was uh, kind of very general high-level overview of many different pathways to uh, dangerous intelligent systems. The problem, as you can probably guess, is that there is almost an infinite landscape we as safety professionals have to protect against, whereas uh, attackers, malevolent uh, groups, only have to find one point of success uh, to penetrate the system. So it's a very challenging problem, and uh, it's not quite obvious if it's solvable in general cases. It seems like we can become much safer 
but it's not obvious if we can be 100% safe with something like that. So I'll kind of start getting into my conclusions and then I'll open open time for questions. So the general conclusions are that uh, this is very, very difficult. Uh, even agreeing on what makes a safe system is not trivial. Different cultures, different legal jurisdictions have different codes for what constitutes a legal uh, and non-malevolent behavior. So given that any type of intelligence systems reside in this global space of international communications and uh, computer networks, how do you make sure the system remains legal, safe, and moral as it is being used by people from different locations? We don't agree on moral codes, ethical codes. There is not a, a universal set of behaviors. So in addition to problem of converting those moral beliefs, laws into the computer code and making sure it is actually uh, well implemented and aligned with what we had in mind, there is not even an initial agreement on what it is we should be trying to encode. Uh, I guess my main argument is that while there is a huge array of different potential problems and situations which can cause unsafe behavior, I believe that probably the worst problem is intentional malevolent design. It is the least research, uh, the least researched uh, sub problem. In fact, I'm only aware of maybe one or two papers on that uh, problem, and most of them come either from me or people who collaborated with me on this. And uh, my guess is the reason for such limited uh, amount of research is because the problem is so hard. Almost everything else you can kind of solve by being sufficiently clever, but someone doing something malevolent on purpose is essentially reducing this problem to solving the bad human problem. How do you make sure a human is safe? And we have failed to, to address it for millennia. I mean, we have come up with encryption and passwords and passports and uh, all sorts of uh, moral cultural training and at the end of the day even NSA has problems securing its people so it's a very different uh, type of issue and doesn't seem to be like uh, it's something we can come up with a quick solution the problem of course is that while engaging in design of such uh, malevolent on purpose software uh, the, the person executing this is likely to repeat all the same mistakes we find in other uh, subdomains. So all the problems with implementation, with bugs, with uh, value alignment will still persist. But here we have additionally this extra malevolent payload, and that makes it strictly worse. Additionally, I, I think what makes this uh, subdomain worth investigating is that there is a significant number of kind of skeptics about AI risk in the community. People who say we don't have to worry about any malevolence because it will simply not happen for whatever reason. Whereas it's hard to argue that there is not uh, a certain subset of agents interested in doing this on purpose. Again, we see it with computer viruses. Who would ever want to design, you know, malevolent intelligence system? Well, exactly the same people who are producing thousands of different viruses, ransomware, worms, and so on. So this is very powerful in that it um, prevents the uh, argument against uh, AI safety. So basically, AI risk denialism is uh, pretty much stopped with this uh, with this line of research. So if you want to find out more. There is uh, a number of uh, research papers available in open access. You can read about uh, kind of each subdomain I talked about. Uh, if you're interested, you can always, of course, uh, get in touch with me later. But at this point, I will switch to answering some questions, I think. Let's start with the first one. What do you think will end up being the state of the art in AI cybersecurity software, example, deep reinforcement learning or generative adversarial networks. Also, any tips on how to get good data sets to develop this honeypot. So this is very specific to what we have today with machine learning and adversarial systems. Uh, there seems to be pretty good work being done in addressing those. Uh, one, one approach is to train the system with adversarial inputs. 
And if you have sufficiently large data sets and you cover quite enough of those examples, you can at least prevent this type of uh, adversarial inputs from impacting the system. Does it scale to all other problems? Uh, doesn't doesn't look like it. And um, this uh, kind of war between neural networks and designing better fakes and trying to recognize them seems to uh, get more complex and continue for a while. Uh, if you take it to its logical conclusion, we'll have uh, not just kind of single domain adversarial inputs where you have an image or a sound, but you go multimodal adversarial inputs, you create whole adversarial virtual worlds. And so this becomes very complex very quickly. And as the system becomes more advanced, they can really not just attack our neural networks, but also start um, de developing those uh, adversarial attacks against human brains. We know human brain and neural networks have a lot in common. There is some indication that similar types of illusions or delusions also impact the uh, human brain. So in the future, I would predict that we'll see a lot of kind of attacks designed specifically to, to fool a human agent, not just of intelligent systems. Let's move to the next question from Mike. Any idea how serious the lawmakers or government contacts are concerned about AI security? Well, the good news is they're starting to be a lot more concerned. So it used to be that uh, there was almost nothing done. Um, internet was obviously designed with no security in mind. And then we repeated that mistake with Internet of Things. Uh, really, it's Internet of Insecure Things. But now there is more interest from government and from large corporations in at least uh, looking at that aspect. Uh, I can judge just with the number of invitations I get to different workshops on AI and security from top organizations. I probably turn down five or six every month just because there is so many. So this is becoming somewhat huge. Um, I would say that corporations are also following. There is uh, now uh, a lot of uh, effort, for example, from DeepMind, which is a Google uh, sub-branch uh, working on AGI, and they hired a number of people specifically to do AI safety work. They have an AI safety team. They hired external fellows, advisors to look at uh, ethics, to look at social impacts, look at short-term debiasing, but also a little bit uh, towards more futuristic work with superintelligence and how to control them. I think they got Nick Bostrom as one of the fellows uh, to advise them on that. How concerned is the community about foreign government developing malevolent AI systems targeted toward uh, Western society? Uh, that's actually a wonderful question. So apparently, from what I know, there is a deep concern, but we don't want to project that concern too much as not to encourage them more. So while there is obviously this cyber war going on and any cyber weapon can be seen as malevolent AI, I think at this point there is not an explicit program to develop a, a malevolent intelligence by other governments outside of this uh, framework of just penetrating our network and trying to influence our cyber infrastructure, but that's likely to change in the future. What would be a compelling way for humans to gain insight on how well AI cybersecurity software actually works? Normal security software might have a list of virus signatures or hard-coded rules, but a neural network is completely a black box. Any ideas on how to make that black box more transparent to people? So evaluating security is uh, very challenging. It's uh, a very hard problem. We don't have good measures for saying that something is secure. Usually we can measure how insecure something is. We can count the number of known backdoors and unpatched uh, problems, zero day exploits and so on, but it's hard to measure security. There is some very good work being done with um, software verification and validation, but that seems to work for non-intelligent software, which is not learning in new domains, not self-modifying. And it's kind of expensive at this point, so it's for critical systems only. The research in verifying behaviors of intelligent agents in novel domains and new data sets is completely open. And from some early work I did, there seem to be some 
very strong fundamental limitations on what we can do with that. Again, it seems that you can expend significant resources to make it somewhat safer, but you never get to this is 100% safe uh, we can release it. So that's the state of the art as far as I know at this point. As far as uh, black box uh, transparency, there is a lot of research on it. And there is some specific examples of how you can train the neural network to explain itself better. The problem is that if a system is truly more intelligent than a human, let's say it looks at a million data points, a feature vector with thousands of different uh, weights assigned to each feature, any explanation we would get would be a simplification. The actual explanation is too complex, too long, cannot be explained to a human, so we would get maybe top 10 features, this is what the reason was for making this decision. This is kind of like we work with kids. A child is asking you a complex question, you usually go, well, whatever, you know, Santa did it. And uh, that's the best we can probably get in the long term, kind of simplified lies. Um, also, if you kind of think about the human model, a lot of studies show that when we make our decisions, they are not fully rationally made. We kind of intuitively make a decision and then make up a story to explain for how we got to that point. So we are also black boxes in that we cannot truly explain a lot of what we do or how we do even to ourselves. So that's uh, not unusual. It's not just the artificial neural networks. It seems to be the property of those complex intelligence systems in general building this model. Uh, who are the top countries other than U.S. and China applying, working on military AI? Uh, so obviously you named the main ones. I think all the countries with sufficiently stable infrastructure and uh, ability to do it, attempt to do it. Israel is well known for developing very powerful cyber weapons. And lately, we heard a little bit about maybe North Korea does. I'm still kind of skeptical about what they can do, given the state of their infrastructure. But uh, it seems like they were able to penetrate South Korean networks and steal some valuable data. So those are probably the countries I would pay attention to. Are there any plans to develop standards, rules that will regulate AI development so that we can prevent level of AI systems? Uh, yes, there are efforts like that. We published a little bit on it. Of course, the problem is that government regulations almost never work. Uh, drugs are illegal, murder is illegal, uh, it doesn't seem to make a difference. Uh, it would be much better if people who are smart enough to develop this type of capability kind of self-regulated to where they realized it will not be beneficial for anyone, the company will fail if a product fails like that. So. Um, I think it's more important to educate AI researchers than to regulate them. If they understand what the problem is, they they actually care enough, they smart, responsible people who will uh, not make obviously bad decisions. So I feel while there is a lot of work going on and we kind of suggested some uh, regulation uh, pathways, uh, I don't see it as an ultimate solution to the problem. From a research perspective, what are the major sources of uh, funding for this type of research outside of military and government? So for AI safety work, it's it's hard to find kind of traditional uh, NSF grants. Uh, there is a lot more money from industry and nonprofits. So uh, effective altruism movement seems to be funding a lot of those projects, especially at top labs. Uh, open philanthropy project and others have given to it. Uh, the best bet for kind of mainstream academics is to disguise this super intelligence concerns as uh, standard uh, intelligence software verification or uh, social engineering attacks uh, prevention type of work. And then you're much more likely to get uh, funded as a kind of mainstream cybersecurity type work. I heard that self-driving cars have a morality program. They decide which lives to sacrifice when there are no alternatives and some lives will be lost. Any insights on what kind of research is happening in this domain? All right, so there is a lot of work based on philosophy, the trolley problem, people trying to figure out 
Should the car protect the driver? Should it protect the pedestrian? Should it do something else? This is not an engineering problem. This is a moral problem, a philosophical problem. To me, it seems that you have to start with cars which follow rules of the road. I usually don't have to make these decisions. If it's green light, I go on green and somebody happens to run across the road. At least I don't feel terribly responsible for them making decision to cross and red. Uh, it, it seems like it's a good starting point with cars. Uh, I suspect most people will jailbreak their car, whatever moral code is implemented by the manufacturer and make the car protect them, their family, their kids. I would do it. So seems like it makes sense. Uh, North Korea may be just a proxy for Russian public experiments with AI weapon, just speculating. Uh, maybe I have zero insider information on Russia or North Korea. As I said, uh, I do encourage you to follow me on uh, Twitter and Facebook. Just don't follow me home. It's very important. And uh, if you have additional questions, I'm happy to, to answer those. I think my time is running out. You can email me later if you're interested in something I research. Uh, I'm happy to collaborate. And thank you all so much. Mm -hmm.